Nadal Malik Hassan born September 8, 1970 is a former American Army major convicted of killing 13 people and injuring more than 30 others in the Fort Hood mass shooting on November 5, 2009. Hassan was a United States Army Medical Corps psychiatrist. He admitted to the shootings at his court-martial in August 2013. A jury panel of 13 officers convicted him of 13 counts of premeditated murder, 32 counts of attempted murder, and unanimously recommended he be dismissed from the service and sentenced to death. Hassan is incarcerated at the United States Disciplinary Barracks at Fort Leavenworth in Kansas awaiting execution. During the six years Hassan was a medical intern and resident at Walter Reed Army Medical Center, colleagues and superiors were concerned about his job performance and comments. Hassan was not married at the time, and was described as socially isolated, stressed by his work with soldiers, and upset about their accounts of warfare. Two days before the shooting, less than a month before he was due to deploy to Afghanistan, Hassan gave away many of his belongings to a neighbor. Prior to the shooting, Hassan expressed critical views described by colleagues as anti-American. An investigation conducted by the Federal Bureau of Investigation concluded his emails with the late Imam Anwar al-Awlaki were related to his authorized professional research and that he was not a threat. The FBI, Department of Defense and U.S. Senate all conducted investigations after the shootings. The DOD classified the events as workplace violence, pending prosecution of Hassan in a court-martial. The Senate released a report describing the mass shooting as the worst terrorist attack on U.S. soil since September 11, 2001. The decision by the Army to not charge Hassan with terrorism is controversial. Hassan was born in Arlington County, Virginia at Virginia Hospital Center to American parents of Palestinian descent. They immigrated years earlier from al Buray, a city in the West Bank near Jerusalem. Raised in the Muslim faith with his two younger brothers, he attended Wakefield High School in Arlington for his freshman year in 1985. His family moved to Roanoke in 1986, to join his father who moved to the city a year prior to set up what would become a number of successful family-owned businesses which included a market, restaurant, and olive bar. He attended William Fleming High School in Roanoke, Virginia graduating from high school in 1988. Their father died in 1998 at the age of 51. Their mother, known as Nora by the community, passed away in 2001 at the age of 49. As adults, one brother continues to live in Virginia while the other moved to Jerusalem. Hassan enlisted in the United States Army in 1988 after graduating from high school. He attended college during this time, earning an associate's degree in science from Virginia Western Community College in 1992. In 1995, he graduated from Virginia Tech with a bachelor's degree in biochemistry. He completed both of these programs with Latin honors. He was commissioned as an officer in the Army Medical Department in 1997, and enrolled at the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences in Bethesda, Maryland. Hassan's performance was marginal while enrolled at UJUS. He was on academic probation during much of the six years he required to complete the four-year curriculum and graduate medical school. Upon graduation from UJUS in 2003, Hassan completed his internship and residency in psychiatry at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. He completed his psychiatry training with a two-year fellowship in disaster and preventive psychiatry, earning a master's degree in public health. During his training at Walter Reed, he received counseling and extra supervision. According to the Washington Post, Hassan made a presentation titled The Quranic Worldview as it relates to Muslims in the U.S. military during his senior year of residency at Walter Reed. It was not well received by some attendees. He suggested the Department of Defense should allow Muslim soldiers the option of being released as conscientious objectors to increase troop morale and decrease adverse events. On a previous slide, he explained adverse events could be refusal to deploy, espionage, or killing of fellow soldiers. Retired Colonel Terry Lee, after working with Hassan, recalled the fatal shooting of two recruiters in Little Rock, Arkansas greatly affected Hassan. The suspect Abdullah and Mujahid Muhammad later claimed to be an al-Qaeda terrorist. He was charged with murder. Colonel Lee told Fox News Hassan made outlandish statements against the American military presence in Iraq and Afghanistan. The Muslims should stand up and fight against the aggressor, referring to American soldiers. Hassan reportedly was agitated, and frequently argued with soldiers. He expressed hope President Barack Obama would withdraw troops. Despite these problems, in May 2009, Hassan was promoted to major. In July 2009, Hassan was transferred to Darnell Army Medical Center in Fort Hood, Texas, moving into an undesirable area of the city of Killeen. Two weeks later, he lawfully purchased an FN or Stahl 5.7mm handgun. Prior to his transfer, he received a poor performance evaluation from supervisors and medical faculty. Despite concerns, his former Army boss, 
Lt. Col. Ben Phillips, graded his performance as outstanding. This was revealed while Phillips a witness during Hassan's trial. His cousin, Nader Hassan, a Virginia attorney, disputed Hassan was disenchanted with the military, but he dreaded war after counseling soldiers with post-traumatic stress disorder. He was mortified by the idea of deploying after he heard a daily basis the horrors they saw over there. Nader also stated Hassan was harassed by his fellow soldiers. He hired a military attorney to try to have the issue resolved, pay back the government, to get out of the military. He was at the end of trying everything. Hassan's aunt also said Hassan sought discharge because of harassment relating to his Islamic faith. However, an army spokesman did not confirm the relative statements, with the deputy director of the American Muslim Armed Forces and Veterans Affairs Council stating the reported harassment was inconsistent with their records. His uncle Rafiq Ahmad, a resident of Ramallah in the West Bank, said Hassan was gentle, quiet. He fainted while observing childbirth, the reason he chose psychiatry. He was deeply sensitive, and mourned a pet bird for months after it died. Also near Ramallah, cousin Mohammed Hassan said because he's Muslim, he didn't want to go to Afghanistan or Iraq, and he didn't want to expose himself to violence and death. Mohammed stated his cousin was a pleasant young man who was happy to graduate and to be joining the army after his uncle and cousin served. They never talked about politics, but Hassan complained he was treated like a Muslim, like an Arab, rather than an American, he was discriminated against. In August 2009, according to a Colleen, Texas police report, someone vandalized Hassan's automobile with a key, repair was estimated at $1,000. Police charged a soldier, a neighbor claimed the vehicle was vandalized because of Hassan's religion. According to military records, Hassan was unmarried. However, David Cook, a former neighbor, stated, in 1997, Hassan had two sons living with him and attending local schools. Cook said, as far as I know, he was a single father. I never saw a wife. Hassan received the Army Service Ribbon as a private in 1988 after completing advanced individual training, the National Defense Service Medal twice for service during the time periods of the Persian Gulf War and the Global War on Terror, and the Global War on Terrorism Service Medal for support service during the Global War on Terror. According to one of his cousins, Hassan was Muslim, he became more devout after early deaths of his parents. His cousin did not recall him expressing any radical or anti-American views, and family also described Hassan as a peaceful person, and a good American. One of his cousins said Hassan turned against the wars after hearing the stories of soldiers he treated in therapy following their return from Afghanistan and Iraq. His aunt said he did not tell the family he was going to Afghanistan. In May 2001, Hassan attended the Dar al-Hijra Mosque in the Falls Church area for the funeral of his mother and occasionally, attended a mosque in Silver Spring, Maryland, close to where he lived and worked, he was well known by the imam for over a decade. Faisal Khan, the former imam of the Silver Spring Mosque where Hassan prayed several times a week, said he was a reserved guy with a nice personality. We discussed religious matters. Politics were never brought up. He is Muslim. Khan said Hassan often expressed his wish to get married, and the imam said, I got the impression he was a committed soldier. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Val Finnell, a graduate school classmate in the Masters in Public Health program, said in a class on environmental health, Hassan's project dealt with whether the global war on terror is a war on Islam and the effect on Muslims in the military, which Finnell thought was strange. According to Colonel Terry Lee, since retired, Hassan said maybe Muslims should stand up and fight against the aggressor. At first, we thought he meant help the armed forces, but apparently that wasn't the case. Other times, he said we shouldn't be in the war in the first place. 2001-2002, Anwar al-Awlaki was the imam of the Dar al-Hijra Mosque, during that time, he was considered a moderate Muslim. Serving as the Muslim chaplain at George Washington University, he was frequently invited to speak about Islam to audiences in Washington DC and to members of Congress and the government. Hassan reportedly has deep respect for al-Awlaki's teachings. Six months prior to the shooting, in December 2008, federal intelligence officials captured a series of email exchanges between al-Awlaki and Hassan. During this period, al-Awlaki was deemed a radical cleric. However, they determined the emails were religious, and did not contain any elements of militancy nor any concerning subject matter. Counterterrorism specialists for the FBI reading the emails stated they were consistent with authorized research Major Hassan was conducting. The emails contain general questions about spiritual guidance with regard to conflicts between Islam and military service, and officials judged them to be consistent with his legitimate mental health research about Muslims in the American armed services. 
After the shootings, the Yemeni journalist Abdullah Haider Sia interviewed Al Awlaki in November 2009 about their exchanges and discussed their time with a Washington Post reporter. According to Sia, Al Awlaki said he neither ordered nor pressured Hassan to harm Americans. Al Awlaki said Hassan first emailed him on December 17, 2008. By way of introduction, Hassan said, Do you remember me? I used to pray with you at the Virginia Mosque. According to Al Awlaki, Hassan said he was Muslim around the time the Imam was preaching at Dar al Hijra in 2001 and 2002. This coincides with the death of his mother. Al Awlaki said, Maybe Nadal was affected by one of my lectures. He added, It was clear, from his emails, Nadal trusted me. Nadal told me, I speak with you about issues I never speak with anyone. Al Awlaki said Hassan arrived at his conclusions regarding the acceptability of violence in Islam, and said he was not the one to initiate this. Sia summarized their relationship by saying, Nadal was providing evidence to Anwar, not vice versa. In October 2008, Charles Allen, U.S. Undersecretary of Homeland Security for Intelligence and Analysis, warned al Awlaki targets U.S. Muslims with radical online lectures encouraging terrorist attacks from his new home in Yemen. After the Fort Hood shootings and news of the emails became public, Allen, no longer in government, said. I find it difficult to understand why an army major would be in repeated contact with an Islamic extremist like Anwar al-Awlaki, who preaches a hateful ideology directed at inciting violence against the United States and the West, it is hard to see how repeated contact would in any legitimate way further his research as a psychiatrist. Former CIA officer Bruce Riedel says emailing a known al-Qaeda sympathizer should set off alarm bells. Even if he was exchanging recipes, the Bureau should have put out an alert. Al Awlaki had a website with a blog to share his views. On December 11, 2008, he condemned any Muslim who seeks a religious decree that would allow him to serve in the armies of the disbelievers and fight against his brothers. The Nifa Foundation says, on December 23, 2008, six days after he said Hassan first emailed him, Al Awlaki wrote on his blog, The bullets of the fighters of Afghanistan and Iraq are a reflection of the feelings of Muslims toward America. An unidentified Muslim officer at Fort Hood said Hassan's eyes lit up while speaking about al Awlaki's teachings. Some investigators believe Hassan's contacts with al Awlaki pushed him toward violence at a time he was suffering depression and stress. The government agents monitoring Islamic websites believe Hassan, using the screen name Nadal Hassan, posted about suicide bombings in May 2009, although, during this period, government agents did not link the post to Hassan. The postings by Nadal Hassan likened a suicide bomber to a soldier falling on a grenade to save his colleagues, to sacrifice for a noble cause. ABC News reported after the fact, anonymous government agents issued a press release claiming they were allegedly aware Hassan attempted to contact al-Qaeda, then issued a press release claiming Hassan had more unexplained connections to people tracked by the FBI than just Anwar al-Awlaki. Hassan's business card left in his apartment describes him as a psychiatrist specializing in behavioral health, mental health, life skills, and contains the acronym SOA. According to investigators, the acronym SOA is used on jihadist websites as an acronym for Soldier of Allah or Servant of Allah. SWT is commonly used to mean Subhanahu wa ta'ala glory to God. A review of Hassan's computer and email accounts show visits to internet sites espousing radical Islamist ideas, according to a press release from an anonymous government agent. Hassan expressed concern about the former actions by some of the soldiers he evaluated as a psychiatrist. Days before his attacks on Fort Hood in 2009, Hassan asked his supervisors and army legal advisors how to handle reports of soldiers' deeds in Afghanistan and Iraq that disturbed him. Hassan was to be deployed to Afghanistan on November 28. Hassan told a local store owner he was stressed about his imminent deployment to Afghanistan since his work as a psychologist might require him to fight or kill fellow Muslims. In a press release from Jeff Sadowski, spokesman for U.S. Senator K. Bailey Hutchison, Hassan was upset about his deployment. Hassan gave away furniture from his home on the morning of the shooting, saying he was going to be deployed on Friday. He also distributed copies of the Quran. Kemran Pasha wrote about a Muslim officer at Fort Hood who said he prayed with Hassan on the day of the Fort Hood shooting, and Hassan appeared relaxed and not in any way troubled or nervous. This officer believed the shootings could possibly be motivated by religious radicalism. On November 5, 2009, Hassan reportedly shouted Allahu Akbar. The phrase means God is the greatest, and opened fire on armed forces in the Soldier Readiness Center of Fort Hood, located in Killeen, Texas, killing 13 people and wounding over 30 others in the worst shooting against armed forces on an American military base. Department of the Army Police Officer Kimberly D. Munley encountered Hassan exiting the building. 
Munley and Hassan exchanged shots before Munley was shot in the leg twice. Department of the Army Police Officer Mark Todd shot Hassan several times. Todd kicked the pistol out of Hassan's hand, then cuffed Hassan. The attack lasted about 10 minutes. To save his life, Hassan was hospitalized in the intensive care unit at Brook Army Medical Center at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas. His condition was described as stable. News reports on November 7, 2009, indicated he was in a coma. On November 9, hospital spokesperson Dewey Mitchell announced Hassan regained consciousness and was able to talk since he was removed from a ventilator on November 7. On November 13, Hassan's attorney, John Galligan, announced Hassan was paralyzed from the waist down from the bullet wounds to his spine and would likely never walk. In mid-December, Galligan indicated Hassan was moved from intensive care to a private hospital room. Galligan said doctors said Hassan would need at least two months in the hospital to learn to care for himself. On November 7, 2009, while Hassan was communicative, he refused to talk to law enforcement officials. On November 12 and December 2, respectively, Hassan was charged with 13 counts of premeditated murder and 32 counts of attempted murder under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, thus making him eligible for the death penalty. At the time, authorities did not specify if they would seek the death penalty, Colonel Michael Mulligan would serve as the Army's lead prosecutor. Mulligan was lead prosecutor on the Hassan Akbar case, in which a soldier was sentenced to death for the murder of two members of the U.S. military. John P. Galligan, a retired Army JAG colonel, represented Hassan. On November 21, in a hearing held in Hassan's hospital room, a military magistrate ruled there was probable cause Hassan committed the shooting spree at Fort Hood, and ordered pretrial confinement until his court-martial. Hassan remained in intensive care in accordance with the magistrate's dictate. On November 23, Galligan said Hassan would likely plead not guilty to the charges against him, and may use an insanity defense at his court-martial. In a press release, Army Public Affairs staff stated doctors would evaluate Hassan by mid-January 2010 to determine his competency to stand trial as well as his mental state at the time of the attacks, but delayed the exam on request from Galligan until after the Article 32 hearing. The Army dictated Hassan speak only in English on the phone or with visitors unless an interpreter was present. Hassan was moved from Brook Army Medical Center to the Bell County Jail in Belton, Texas, on April 9, 2010. Fort Hood negotiated a renewable $207,000 contract with Bell County in March to house Hassan for six months. In a press release, Galligan announced prosecutors would seek the death penalty, stating, It is the first formal notice but, of course, it is a virtual given from the start. In short, the Army has been pursuing death from the get-go. The prosecutors filed a memo on April 28, 2010, stating the aggravating factor necessary for pursuit of the death penalty will be satisfied if Hassan is found guilty of more than one murder. The decision to seek the death penalty followed the Article 32 hearing. In September 15, 2010 press release, Hassan's attorney stated he intended to seek closed court hearings. On October 12, 2010, Hassan was due to appear for his first broad military hearing into the attack. The hearing, formally called an Article 32 proceeding, akin to a grand jury hearing but open to the public, was expected to span six weeks. The hearing, designed to help the top army commander at Fort Hood determine whether there was enough evidence to court-martial Hassan, was scheduled to begin calling witnesses, but was delayed by technicality disputes. The hearing proceeded on October 14 with witness testimonies from survivors of the attacks. On November 15, the military hearing ended after Galligan declined to offer a defense case, on the grounds the White House and Defense Department refused to release documents he requested pertaining to an intelligence review of the shootings. Neither the defense nor prosecution offered to deliver a closing argument. On November 18, Colonel James L. Pohl, investigating officer for the Article 32 hearing, recommended Hassan be court-martialed and face the death penalty. His recommendation was forwarded to another U.S. Army colonel at Fort Hood, who, after filing his report, presented his recommendation to the post commander. The post commander decided Hassan would face a trial in the death penalty. On July 6, 2011, the Fort Hood post commander referred the case to a general court-martial authorized to consider the death penalty. On July 27, 2011, Fort Hood Chief Circuit Judge Colonel Gregory Gross set a March 5, 2012, trial date. Hassan declined to enter any plea, and Judge Gross granted a request by Hassan's attorneys to defer the plea. Hassan notified Gross he had released John Galligan, his civilian attorney during previous court appearances, choosing to be represented by three military lawyers. On February 2, 2012, a military judge delayed trial until June 12, 2012. Lieutenant. Colonel Chris Poppy, Hassan's lead attorney, 
said the request to delay the trial was purely a matter of necessity of adequate time for pretrial preparation. On April 10, 2012, Hassan's lawyers requested another continuance to move the trial start date from June to late October to investigate paperwork and evidence and interview witnesses. Gross agreed to take the request under advisement. Judge Gross denied a defense motion seeking a defense-initiated victim outreach specialist to testify, Fort Hood officials said. The new program is intended to help the defense respond to the needs of survivors and victims' families, and possibly change their attitudes if they support the death penalty. Gross also denied a defense request to force prosecutors to provide notes from meetings and conversations with President Barack Obama, the defense secretary, and other government agents after the November 5, 2009 attacks. Defense attorneys argued they wanted to determine if anything unlawfully influenced Hassan's chain of command to prosecute him. On April 18, 2012, Judge Gross granted in part the defense motion for a continuance, scheduling the trial for August 20, 2012. In July 2012, after dictating Hassan shave his beard, the judge found Hassan in contempt of court and fined him. He was fined once more for retaining his beard, and was warned by Judge Colonel Gregory Gross he could be forced shaved prior to his court-martial. On August 15, Hassan was scheduled to enter pleas to the charges brought against him before the beginning of the court-martial, he would not be allowed to plead guilty for the premeditated murder charges because prosecutors pursued the death penalty. The court-martial was delayed by Hassan's objections to being shaved against his will, and his appeal to the United States Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces regarding the matter. Through his attorneys, Hassan said his beard is part of his religious beliefs. The prosecutors argued Hassan was simply trying to delay his trial. On August 27, the appeals court announced the trial could continue, but did not rule whether Hassan could be forced shaved nor did they set a new date for the start of the trial. The appeals court rejected attempts by Hassan to receive religious accommodation to grow a beard. On September 6, Colonel Gross ruled Hassan be forced shaved after he determined the 1993 Religious Freedom Restoration Act did not apply to this case, however, the forced shave will not be enforced until Hassan's appeals are exhausted. During the September 6 hearing, Hassan twice offered to plead guilty, however U.S. Army rules prohibit judges from accepting a guilty plea in a death penalty case. Hassan remained incarcerated and in a wheelchair. He continued to receive paychecks, and his medical expenses are paid by American taxpayers. On June 3, 2013, a military judge allowed Hassan to represent himself. His attorneys were to remain on the case, but only if he asked for their help. Jury selection was set to start on June 5, and opening arguments were scheduled to begin on July 1. June 14, 2013, U.S. Army Colonel Tara Osborne dictated Hassan could not claim he was defending the Taliban. In a press release, Hassan justified his actions during the Fort Hood attacks by claiming the U.S. military was at war against Islam. During the first day of the trial on August 6, Hassan, representing himself, admitted he was the attacker during the Fort Hood attacks in 2009, and stated the evidence would show he was the attacker. He also told the panel hearing he switched sides, and regarded himself as a mujahideen waging jihad waging war against the U.S. military. By August 7, disagreements between Hassan and his standby defense team led Judge Osborne to suspend the trial. Hassan's defense attorneys were concerned Hassan was trying to help prosecutors achieve a death sentence. Because the prosecutors sought the death penalty, his defense team sought to prevent this. On August 8, Judge Osborne ruled Hassan could continue to represent himself during the trial, then rejected his standby defense team's request they take over Hassan's defense or have their roles reduced. The judge also declined the defense lawyer's request they be removed from the case. On August 9, Hassan allowed two of his three standby defense lawyers Lt. Col. Christopher Martin and Major Joseph Marcy to seek leave to prepare an appeal arguing the defendant was seeking the death penalty, thus undermining their rules of professional conduct. His third attorney Lt. Col. Chris Poppy remained behind to observe the court proceedings. Court proceedings also resumed with the prosecution presenting testimonies from several survivors of the Fort Hood attacks. By August 14, more than 60 prosecution witnesses testified, and each identified Hassan as the attacker. Court proceedings were speedy because Hassan raised few objections and declined to cross-examine most witnesses. By August 13, prosecutors shifted to presenting forensic evidence with FBI agents present at the crime scene testifying they had so much evidence at the crime scene, they ran out of markers. This evidence included 146 cartridge casings and six magazines. The New York Times published remarks by Hassan from a mental health report supplied by the defendant's civil attorney John Galligan. According to these documents, Hassan told mental health professionals he would still be a martyr if he was convicted and executed. Hassan, acting as his defense lawyer, 
offered to share the report with prosecutors during his court-martial. However, on August 14, Judge Osborne blocked prosecutors from seeing the report. On August 19, she also excluded prosecuting evidence relating to Hassan's early radicalization, plus evidence which presented the Fort Hood attacks as a copycat based on the actions of Hassan Akbar, U.S. Army soldier sentenced to death. On August 20, 2013, prosecutors rested their case against Hassan. They called nearly 90 witnesses over 11 days with the fast pace of proceedings attributed to Hassan's refusal to cross-examine most witnesses. Throughout the proceedings, he only questioned three witnesses. While the defense was scheduled to present his case on Wednesday, Hassan indicated he had no plans to call any defense witnesses. Earlier, he planned to call two defense witnesses, one a mitigation expert in capital murder cases, and the other a California University professor specializing in philosophy and religion. Hassan also formally declined to argue prosecutors failed to prove their case. Hassan did not call any witnesses or testify in his defense, he rested his defense on August 21, 2013. On August 22, 2013, Hassan declined to give a closing argument. On August 23, 2013, the military jury consisting of nine colonels, three lieutenant colonels, and one major convicted Hassan of all charges, making him eligible for the death penalty. Those deliberations began on August 26, 2013. By August 27, the 13 member panel of jurors heard testimony from 24 victims and family members of those wounded and killed during the 2009 Fort Hood attacks against American armed forces. Throughout the proceedings, Hassan declined to speak in his defense or question any of the witnesses. He also did not provide any material explaining his decision to not mount a defense throughout the trial and sentencing. At the end, Hassan, acting as his attorney, told jurors the defense rested his case. Judge Tara Osborne accepted Hassan's decision. In his final statement, lead prosecutor Colonel Mike Mulligan said, Hassan can never be a martyr because he has nothing to give, do not be misled, do not be confused, do not be fooled. He is not giving his life. We are taking his life. This is not his gift to God, it's his debt to society. He will not now and will not ever be a martyr. The jurors reconvened to decide sentencing. On August 28, 2013, the jurors recommended Hassan be sentenced to death. The panel also recommended Hassan forfeit his military pay and be dismissed from the army, a separation for officers carrying the same consequences as a dishonorable discharge. Some Muslims claim the events in Islamist terms for political purposes. After the Fort Hood attacks, Anwar al-Awlaki praised Hassan's actions. Nadal Hassan is a hero. He is a man of conscience who could not bear living the contradiction of being a Muslim and serving in an army fighting against his people. Any decent Muslim cannot live, understanding properly his duties toward his creator and his fellow Muslims, and yet serve as a member of the U.S. armed forces. The U.S. is leading the war against terrorism which, in reality, is a war against Islam. Al-Awlaki posted this as part of a lengthy internet message. In March 2010, Al-Qaeda spokesmodel Adam Yahya Gadan praised Hassan, saying, although he was not a member of Al-Qaeda, the Mujahid brother shown us what one righteous Muslim with an assault rifle can do for his religion and brothers in faith, is a pioneer, a trailblazer, and a role model, and yearns to discharge his duty to Allah and play a part in the defense of Muslims against the savage, heartless, and bloody Zionist crusader assault on our religion, sacred places, and homelands. Hours before the attacks, CNN posted an interview and video of a New York City organization called Revolution Muslim in which Yunus Abdullah Muhammad a Jew converted to Islam spoke outside a New York mosque, saying U.S. armed forces are legitimate targets, and Osama bin Laden was their model. The evening after the attacks, Revolution Muslim posted support for Hassan on their website, one of the few American sites to do so. In the video, RM described American armed forces as slain terrorists in the eternal hellfire. Some Muslims condemned the organization. A November 2009 press release from the Ansar al-Mujahideen network cited Hassan as a role model. They congratulated him for his brave and heroic deed for standing up to the modern Zionist Christian crusades against Muslims. A military activist, Selina Kopa, said, This man was a mental health professional and was working with other mental health professionals every day, and they failed to notice how deeply disturbed someone right in their midst was. Philip Sherwell and Alex Spilius, reporters for The Telegraph, wrote, characteristics attributed to Hassan by acquaintances withdrawn, unassuming, brooding, socially awkward, and never known to have a girlfriend applied to other mass murderers. Hassan's perceived beliefs were also a cause for concern among some of his peers. According to an anonymous source, Hassan was disciplined for proselytizing about his Muslim faith with patients and colleagues, 
while at Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences, the Telegraph reported an incident in which some attendees felt one of his lectures, expected it to be of a medical nature, became a diatribe against infidels. Air Force Dr. Val Finnell, a former medical school classmate, complained to superiors about Hassan's anti-American rants, said, the system is not doing what it's supposed to do. He at least should have been confronted about these beliefs, told to cease and desist, and to shape up or ship out. Before revealing the contents of the emails, Jarrett Brackman, a scholar of terrorism, said Hassan's contacts with al-Awlaki raised huge red flags. According to Brackman, al-Awlaki is a major influence internationally on English-speaking jihadists. The Dallas Morning News reported on November 17 ABC News, citing anonymous sources, reported law enforcement officials suspect the attacks were triggered by the refusal of Hassan's superiors to process his requests sought to have some of his patients prosecuted for war crimes based on statements they made during psychiatric sessions with him. Dallas attorney Patrick McLean, a former Marine, opined Hassan was lawfully justified in sharing privileged information from his patients, but it was impossible to be sure without knowing that information. Some fellow psychiatrists complained to superiors Hassan's requests violated physician-patient privilege. Shortly after the attacks, General George Casey, Chief of Staff of the Army, said the real tragedy would be harming the cause of diversity, saying, as great a tragedy as this was, it would be a shame if our diversity became a casualty as well. Several months later, in a February 2010 interview, Casey said, our diversity not only in our army, but in our country, is a strength. And as horrific as this tragedy was, if our diversity becomes a casualty, I think that's worse. FBI Director Robert Mueller appointed William Webster, a former director of the FBI, to conduct an independent review of the Bureau's handling of investigations related to Hassan and whether they missed indicators of an attack. Webster was selected for the job due to, as Mueller stated, being uniquely qualified for such a review, and the Webster Commission's press release includes several recommendations including written policies to clarify the ownership of leads, integration of databases, and acquiring search capabilities for all relevant databases based on computational analysis of textual data to replace simple keyword searches. On the November 9, 2009, Fox News Sunday show, U.S. Senator Joe Lieberman called for a probe by his Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs. In his press release, Lieberman said, if the reports we're receiving of various statements he made, acts he took, are valid, he turned to Islamist extremism, if that is true, the murder of these 13 people was a terrorist act, I think it's very important to let the Army and the FBI go forward with this investigation before we reach any conclusions. The November 23rd cover of the European and US editions of Time magazine featured a photograph of Hassan, with the title terrorist? Over his eyes. Nancy Gibbs reported the cover story, Hassan matched the classic model of the lone, strange, crazy killer, the quiet and gentle man who formed few close human attachments. She noted, Hassan's motives were mixed enough everyone with an agenda could find markers in the trail he left. Bruce Hoffman, a terrorism scholar and Georgetown University professor, told Gibbs I used to argue it was only terrorism if it were part of some identifiable organized conspiracy, the nature of terrorism is changing, and Major Hassan may be an example of that. The Christian Science Monitor also questioned whether Hassan was a terrorist. On November 14, the New York Times asked, was Major Hassan a terrorist, driven by religious extremism to attack fellow soldiers he had come to see as the enemy? Was he a troubled loner, a misfit who cracked when ordered sent to a war zone whose gruesome casualties he spent the last six years caring for? Or was he both? The reporters write, Major Hassan may be the latest example of an increasingly common type of terrorist, self-radicalized with the help of the internet, and wreaks havoc without support from overseas networks and without having to cross a border to reach his target. Following his conviction and sentencing, Nadal Hassan was incarcerated at the United States Disciplinary Barracks at Fort Leavenworth in Kansas to await execution. According to Chris Haug, Fort Hood's chief of media relations, Hassan was stripped of his rank and dismissed from the U.S. Army. Hassan would only be referred to as inmate Nadal Hassan going forward. On September 5, 2013, prison staff forced shaved Hassan. Fort Leavenworth authorities justified their decision by citing Hassan would be subject to army regulations although he was dismissed from the army and forfeited all pay and allowances. Despite army regulations banning personnel from facial hair, Hassan stopped shaving following the Fort Hood attacks in 2009 by citing his religious beliefs. Although no new photos of Hassan are released since his incarceration, military authorities confirmed a video recording of the forced shaving exists per military regulations. In response, John Galligan, Hassan's former civilian lawyer, 
planned to sue the military for violating his religious beliefs. Galligan argued a military council in 2012 allowed Hassan to keep his beard for the duration of the trial, and dismissed the army's actions as vindictive. On August 28, 2014, his attorney said Hassan wrote to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, then head of the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. In the letter, Hassan requested to be made a citizen of the Islamic State, and included his signature and the abbreviation SOA. Soldier of Allah.